So this is clinical neurology in outpatient practice. All the videos that I'll be showing today are all uh, my patients. So all taken in the outpatients only. I specifically not included any inpatient videos so that it should be real life how you can diagnose certain small uh, clinical signs and uh, make some uh, concrete decisions based on that. Even why this is needed today, even after having so much expertise in advancements in uh, newer technologies and modern newer molecular genetics, still the age old clinical examination, especially the clinical neurology uh, holds true for most of the diagnosis. And without that basic clinical neurology, we can't proceed further, especially in this era of uh, hyper investigation, defensive medicine, we do a lot of tests and many investigations come back uh, inconclusive. So at the end of the day, there may be more confusion rather than clarity if you don't have a proper approach. So clinical assessments, why it is needed? We understand the disease better. We can localize, we can do differential diagnosis and further evaluation and management. What a very good clinical assessment can lead to is a precise localization of the disease, where it is exactly, whether it's in the brain, whether it's the spinal cord, whether it's in the neuromuscular junction, whether it's in the muscle, and uh, the differential diagnosis can narrow down tremendously. So the further evaluation, what tests need to be done is the most important uh, part of the decision making at the end of the clinical examination. So if you do proper clinical examination, you can avoid a lot of tests. That is the most important thing. So management decisions can become crisp and clear and clear communication to the patient. And uh, at the end of the day, this is much, much more cost effective by avoiding too many unnecessary investigations. So in the high tech era, a good thorough clinical assessment becomes um, at risk of extinction. The trend is brief clinical assessment. Why this happens? Most of us have busy OPDs and different priorities. As I told you, the clinical examination is most of the time uh, done to avoid certain tests. But when the patients come with all the tests to you with the MRI, EEG already done, you might ask what's the fun of doing uh, clinical examination. Many times examination is done to avoid MRI. But by the time the patient comes to you with the MRI, some of the examination may become redundant. And uh, more importantly, off late, most of our time is spent in counseling, also known as Google queries. So I'll give you an example. I recently diagnosed a child with a uh, uh, first episode seizure, a three-year-old child. The father was having a chit with uh, many questions written down. It was very interesting. So he was saying, um, the child was born by uh, force of delivery. Okay. What is the next question? Um, Okay, what's the next question? Annikala Yenatechi Talekulikavacho. Okay. Previous night ice cream sapped down. Okay. So it went on and on and on. So I was like, please give me a break. Let me discuss with you something very important. Okay. So this is reality. And off late, this is becoming much more. Why I am highlighting this? Because most of our time is spent on these. Uh, the questions that patients have that may not be relevant to any of your counseling. So naturally your clinical uh, examination curtails because you have limited time. All of us have busy OPDs. We have limited time. So we have to prioritize. Still clinical neurology is very critical and despite high quality imaging and other newer investigations, age old clinical neurology is the fulcrum of diagnosis for most of cases. Say for example, epilepsy, the most common uh, pediatric neurology problem all of us face, there is no test that will give you the diagnosis of epilepsy. Epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis. So you have to really spend time in history and uh, examination to diagnose epilepsy. MRI will not tell you whether it's epilepsy. EEG will not tell you it's, it's epilepsy or not. And another common condition, migraine and headache. It's a clinical diagnosis. So no amount of investigation will give you the diagnosis of migraine especially in the current era of genetic diagnosis, you need a deep phenotyping. What do you mean by deep phenotyping? You have to look for handles, hard clinical findings in the history as well as in the examination. Without proper differential diagnosis, 
what are you thinking about the genetic diagnosis will be useless because most of us have accessible uh, access to next generation uh, genetic screening and whole exome sequencing many of the pediatricians are ordering these tests but without a proper phenotype the results ends up being variant of unknown significance because the lab doesn't know what the patient has if you don't tell them exactly what you are looking for they will say i find something i don't know the significance that is what variant of unknown significance i am sure all of you have had genetic report coming back to you saying variant of unknown significance the lab puts up the hands i don't know what it is so you have to give them proper phenotype that means proper clinical assessment one example of why you need a examination in headaches there are three uh, cardinal signs or three red flag signs where you will definitely do click uh, mri where you will definitely do neuroimaging ataxia papilledema neurological deficits if the patient doesn't have the three no ataxia no papilledema no neurological deficits you don't need neuroimaging but if the patient has already come with mri showing normal there is no posterior fossa mass this is all redundant now okay so that's how it goes so what is the drawback sir i can do all the investigation patient is affordable everything is available why you have problem it's not that simple parents nowadays demand this i'll give you an example recently just four days back uh, i was preparing for this um, uh, talk and one patient came with a weakness of face weakness of uh, limb girdle so i diagnosed that clinically as uh, facio scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy it's a very rare genetic condition facio scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy and i was trying to explain to the parents uh, uh, this is a rare genetic condition we have to do certain tests then we can uh, diagnose this father was like sir or a test vechirkingle sir adha panni paarenga sir i was like when did i develop some tests for a rare disease of fsh md in a test sir sir eeg vechirkingle sir adha konjam panni paarenga sir i was like okay this is very new to me like people with headaches they ask for ct scan people with headaches they ask for eeg we politely decline somebody with a neuromuscular disease asking me sir why don't you do eeg so that is how it's going now this is all clinical uh, scenarios what i feel i'm telling you i am not making it up i wish i make it up don't so poor clinical acumen in this kind of confusion can lead to more tests unfortunately more tests lead to more confusion that is why we need to know exactly what test we are ordering why we are ordering what are we trying to answer by that test and what is the likely outcome right 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 many times incidental findings we come across ct scans can show incidental finding mri scan show incidental finding eeg scan show incidental findings one of the most common headache for clinicians is incidental finding especially somebody does mri for headache it can become headache for you because it shows arachnoid cyst one father was very anxious very anxious very anxious i explained to him sir arachnoid cyst birth la end irukku idunala eduvume aagala idu eduvume aagadhu idukkum thalavalikkum sambandhame illa idu just a incidental finding so this is straight forward easily understandable words he was like no 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 sir ellarum solranga idu vandu expand aaguma idu vandu grow aaguma idu burst aaguma i understood your google nalla padichu vandirkar and he was not sleeping for four nights before he was meeting me because of the google then finally two three sessions it took for me to convince that parent that it is nothing so you cannot just like that uh, uh, wish away these incidental findings that is our usual response so nothing uh, we expect parents will ac accept that because we have so much experience with these we have seen hundreds of arachnoids none of them had any problem but parents they won't accept this you have to explain to them you have to tell them you have to spend a lot of time so that becomes a big headache once there was a radiological report saying a 3 year old girl child mri was done it was reported as adrenal leukodystrophy ald 3 year old girl child ald is a xling disorder girl child don't have a ald so many times the radiological reports can be misleading finally what that child had it was normal variant 
for a three year old child there can be some hyper intensities in the posterior uh, region that can be normal um, myelination variant so that's what she had but the radiology report told it was adrenal leukodystrophy so you should not go by the report you should use your clinical acumen so observation is the key most of the times pediatric neurological examination is just observation even before you put the your hand on the child you just observe when they are in the waiting room when they enter your room when they are in the mother's lap when you take history observe most of the time observation will give you the diagnosis in pediatric neurology so developmental age assessment is part of neurological examination again we carefully observe the child we ask the parent to demonstrate certain milestones if the parent says my child can walk please demonstrate let him walk so that's the best way to assess development and there are some simple maneuvers we all know one of the most important rewarding uh, point of being a pediatric neurologist is you have to be very 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 child friendly you cannot uh, be intimidating or frightening to the child and uh, achieve a better diagnosis you should engage the child you should be friendly to the child and uh, mother is always right how we say wives are always right so mother is always right until proven otherwise this is a clinical dictum and this is uh, we have seen most of the times when mother says my child is sick please admit the child please admit the child most of the time mother's instinct is very correct many times these children are sent home no 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 child nalla irukku nu solli they come back middle of the night with uh, more complications so coming to actual part the tone examination so this is a simple maneuver where you just put your finger under the uh, hamstring and try to elevate the thigh if you watch carefully the right side the heel is not off the couch and uh, the knee bends on the left side the heel suddenly off the couch the knee doesn't bend immediately so the right side leg normal tone the left side leg spasticity if you just do this simple maneuver if the knees bend immediately and the heel is touching the couch that is normal tone if uh, suddenly the heel lifts up immediately you lift that is hypertonia that is spasticity this is a simple maneuver and this is a child with spastic uh, cp uh, i am trying to do this maneuver of uh, uh, abducting the thighs usually the thighs should be touching the couch both sides whereas in this child it was not so this is a adductor spasticity here i am trying to demonstrate fixed flexion deformity of uh, the hamstrings and the hamstrings are very taut and this we have all seen so many patients so you can stop that by flexing the ankle flexing the uh, plantar flexing the ankle so this is a clonus so this is one of the signs of hypertonia and spasticity the right side tone uh, clonus is ill sustained left side clonus is very well sustained okay so in tone examination you have to find whether it's a normal tone low tone or high tone if it's a high tone whether it's a spasticity or rigidity okay in this child again i am trying to uh, demonstrate at this um, uh, fro frozen window the there is a hamstring spasticity the full extension of the knee is not possible beyond this point it becomes very tight and becomes painful for the child so coming to gait examination we need to note lot of points posture length speed rhythm symmetry steadiness arm swing turning so this particular child you can see what is the gait what is the gait so watch carefully how his left arm right arm swing normal left arm swing not normal skipped like this and the left uh, left leg he is dragging so this is left hemiparetic gait right side normal left hemiparetic gait left arm spasticity left leg circumdension so this child has a bilateral spasticity there it was only left sided hemiparesis here it is um diplegia okay bilateral leg spasticity so this is called crouched gait crouched when there is a severe spasticity of uh, hamstrings 
your knees cannot uh, extend fully so there is a fixed flexion deformity the child will be walking with knees flexed this is called crouched gait so this particular video please watch carefully the child uh, walks with crouched gait again there is an knock knee but the main uh, problem is crouched the main problem is severe uh, uh, hamstring spasticity the same child after one month you can see now the knees are completely normal straight and uh, extended so this is after intensive physiotherapy and botox injection to the hamstrings so this is so much difference between pre botox and post botox so this is possible another child similar he is walking very slowly there bilateral spasticity after botox his gait much better so the learning point here is treating spasticity is worth it many time we diagnose spastic cerebral palsy that is end of everything both for the family and for the doctor it is not so it need not be so you can treat spasticity very much and that can make all the difference between a child who walks a child who doesn't walk you can do intensive physiotherapy oral baclofen botulinum local injection all together many children can at least ambulate with support this is possible especially if the parents are coming to you early if they are committed if they are following your advice that is the biggest problem now okay they will do physiotherapy for a month or two then they will say nanga veetliye pannikrom doctor that doesn't work so you have to do proper physiotherapy and botox then these kids can be improved i'm not saying cured it can be improved and this is a adolescent child you can see the scissoring gait so this is uh, acquired this is not cp so this is uh, this came much later and it's progressive so this is hereditary spastic paraparesis can be sporadic or familial mostly genetic or metabolic some urocycle disorders can present we have seen families with three kids presenting with spastic paraparesis urocycle disorder presenting much later much later so this needs to be recognized and this should be differentiated from cp there are uh, treatments uh, available so so far we have seen gross spasticity but when the pyramidal signs are so subtle how you can elicit this is one maneuver this is called uh, uh, pronator drift you can uh, examine outstretched hand you can see with the eyes closed you can see the left side uh, arm has pronated and it is lower down compared to the right arm so this is pronator drift this is the subtle sign most subtle sign you can have uh, when there is a, no obvious spasticity no obvious uh, uh, pyramidal signs so this is entirely different now till now we have seen the spasticity so this you can see what is the diagnosis i mean what is the examination finding the face is very very different so this is bilateral facial palsy bilateral lower motor neuron facial palsy so she is not able to do most of the things that we are asking her to do she is not able to do e she is not able to do blow and she has a shoulder abduction weakness right more than left so this is facio scapulo humeral muscular dystrophy so face is completely element uh, paresis and uh, there is a arm abduction weakness right side much more than the left side so this is facio scapulo humeral dystrophy one of the muscular dystrophy very rare genetic condition so you would have seen a, a very uh, gover sign so this is a very subtle gover sign what i am showing i'll just conclude in next 2 minutes this is a waiter tip hand you can see eps palsy left side and uh, this kind of asymmetrical ptosis any child presenting with asymmetrical ptosis you should think of myasthenia gravis this is the same child at different time points you can see one time right side is much more affected the other time left side is much more affected sometimes bilateral symmetrical ptosis so this is very different time points she has uh, myasthenia gravis anti acylcholine receptor antibody positive so some of the involuntary movements so this is very characteristic movement of anti nmdr encephalitis and this child had uh, left hemichoria so this is a uh, sydenham's chorea fortunately nowadays very rare sydenham's chorea rheumatic fever and uh, just last one minute any child who presents with extreme irritability you should think about uh, 
Opsoclonus myoclonus. Opsoclonus myoclonus, any child who presents with extreme irritability. And this is a long story. So basically severe dystonia came for uh, deep brain stimulation, improved completely with uh, medical treatment. Has a genetic condition, improved completely with the medical treatment. So don't give up any time. So I'll conclude. So most of the seizure mimics, most of the times I have shown many uh, different seizure mimics. So this is one thing, epileptic spasms should never be missed. This is a, a clinical emergency, epileptic spasms, infantile spasms. It should always be recognized and treated at the earliest. This is medical emergency. Delayed treatment can lead to poor prognosis. So to conclude, the good clinical examination is most enjoying part of our profession. Pediatric examination can be fun, still useful in the era of abnormal reports. Avoids unnecessary investigation as well as risks of unnecessary procedures like MRI under general anesthesia that can be avoided if you are clinically sure what you are dealing with. And most importantly, these are highly cost effective, highly satisfying. Thank you very much. All is open for questions from the audience are invited. Question to Dr. Anthony. How often you come across cystic fibrosis in your practice? How early you can make it up? What is the natural course in your practice? 